I'm Anne Louise Hanstead, and I am here representing the Wild Agency. It's an agency that specializes in behavioral science and leveraging that to drive and motivate um, behaviors that you're trying to achieve in, in your everyday marketing activities. Um, we are gathered to here today with a terrific panel of um, executives from a variety of industries, from big industry to startup, high tech to nonprofit. Um, and I think you're really going to enjoy the dialogue this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to play a little video for you, and then, and then we'll get into the, the intro. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. How those assorted tank tops work out for you? Mr. Yakamoto. Hey, Miss Belfour, did you come back for another pair of those shammy lace ups? So now, welcome to the Naked Truth. Top marketers reveal how they'll survive and thrive in the future. I hope some of you at least remember that movie, Minority Report. It's hard to believe it came out nearly 12 years ago. Um, and when I think it did, every marketer in the world was sort of stunned by that moment walking through the mall, imagining that, that moment in time when you'd actually be able to communicate truly one-to-one -one with your customers. But imagine the implications of that content, data, analytics, targeting, et cetera. It's, it's, it was sort of a phenomenal moment that I'm sure Spielberg wasn't thinking through what all the marketers would take away from that. And yet here we are in 2013, and the technology to enable that moment is actually available today. And so as we start thinking about emerging technologies and all the implications for that, what are marketers thinking about and how are they going to deal with it? So today we've, we've gathered a terrific panel and I'm gonna have them each introduce themselves and uh, then we'll get started. Good morning, my name is Sylvia Tents and I lead global institutional marketing at T. Rowe Price. And so what I'm responsible for are the large institutional clients, really the primarily the B2B side of T. Rowe Price. I have a team in Baltimore, London and Australia and uh, we're focused on really creating the client experience and supporting the sales efforts for our um, businesses in those markets. Good morning, everybody. I'm Justine Metz. I run marketing for the wealth management businesses for Bank of America. So that includes Merrill Lynch, U.S. Trust, and our institutional retirement business, which goes under the Bank of America Merrill Lynch brand. Good morning. I'm Jeffrey Underwood, Director of Brand Marketing at Eaton Vance. Eaton Vance is an asset management company here in Boston. We primarily sell mutual funds to financial advisors, so Merrill Lynch is our target audience. And I've been building a marketing capability in a primarily product and sales organization. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ilya Merman, uh, VP of Marketing at a local uh, venture-backed startup called Yoda, responsible, uh, well, for all the marketing stuff, so demand generation, sales tools, uh, and our startup does uh, mobile site acceleration. Good morning, I'm uh, Peter Doucette. I work at the Boston Globe. I'm the VP of Consumer Sales and Marketing, and uh, I'm charged with uh, managing the migration of readers from print to digital and all the uh, challenges that come along with it. Good morning, my name is Sue Burton. I work for a nonprofit here in Boston called American Student Assistance. We work to help college students and young graduates uh, engage more effectively with their student loan decisions, and so responsible for acquisition and engagement and making millennials care about a topic they'd really rather not talk about.
Thank you. Okay. Well, the, we are going to cover a lot of topics today. Um, and as we do, I'm really hoping that you, the audience, will engage in the discussion as well. This is supposed to be a focus group. Um, so hopefully you're enjoying your M&Ms. Uh, what we're going to do is have you, as we go through the session, um, text your questions to or tw tweet your questions to uh, the Wild Agency. And uh, my colleagues here will bring them up. In the last 10 minutes, we will go through those questions. So the first topic we're going to cover is content marketing. How are companies using content to mold perceptions, influence dialogue, et cetera? Today, more than ever before, there's a wealth of content information out there. And consumers are, are looking at it on all kinds of different platforms. And, and it's highly fragmented. It might be a moment as you're getting your coffee at Starbucks, or it might be a more um, involved engagement sitting at your desk. But at the end of the day, the transformation of mobile and digital and the impact of social on content is sort of changing the dialogue. And marketers are realizing that we need to be very conscious of how we shape that dialogue through the content we deliver. So what are, what are some of the th things that you're dealing with as you engage in that content discussion? And Justine, I'm going to start with you because I know this is really top of mind. Yeah. Now, does this mic work? Can you hear me or not? That is it. No. All right. That goes to the video. OK. I'm all mic'd up. I'm not really sure what's going where. So. Um, to answer the question, I'll give a little bit of context, and um, hopefully it, it, it makes sense. But so people probably remember we had this little thing called the financial crisis about five years ago, and uh, and those of us in the financial services industry were uh, at, in, in, in the in the crosshairs of major changes, uh, and and literally budgets were being cut in half. You know, we were having to do things that were um, the right decision to get the business is back on the right trajectory to health. And so when you are working in a business like um, I work in and many of us work in here, uh, what, what I've said to my management team is, if you have one dollar, you actually spend it on doing some type of a client event. Because there's tangible ROI in that. You know, you put an event together, bring clients in, they actually give you money as a result of that. If you have a second dollar, it's usually some sort of sales support. Meaning, you know, what's the deck that somebody's going to go out and make a pitch to either a prospect or to a client to develop new business, whether it's institutional or a retail client. If, if you have a third dollar, you start building brand or you continue to build brand. And, and, and in our businesses, when you look at Merrill Lynch, how many people have heard of the Merrill Lynch brand? Right? P pretty iconic brand, pretty, pretty big brand. But that's where you sort of like peer, you steal from Peter to give to Paul. You say, okay, well, we'll, we'll sort of neglect brand for a little bit so that we can spend our resources on other things. So what happened is that it became really an imperative for us to get a lot smarter about how we build brand. And one of the things, when you go out and do focus groups with our clients, there are two things that we get credit for in Merrill Lynch or U.S. Trust uh, from, our, from, from clients or from prospects. One is our advisors. Love our advisors. Think they're great. The second is our intelligence. So, you know, we've got these massive research organizations in U.S. Trust in Merrill Lynch and actually at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, which is no, renowned globally. And what are we actually doing with them? Because really, that's tons of content. So we said, well, you know what? If we're not going to be able to do big brand advertising, we're not going to be able to go on and do big TV ads, things like that. It's just don't, we don't have the money to do it. What we could do is we could actually start tapping this intelligence engine and, and, and taking all of these analysts who, by the way, go on CNBC and all of the other um, networks and what if we started to crank up not just that, but then our PR machine, our corporate communications machine, and start doing our own video and, and stuff like that. So what we found was that we could at least sustain. We, we haven't, I would say, made great inroads in building the brands back to the reputation levels that we had before. But we have actually stabilized them by using content. And, and it's, a, uh, it's a massive um, effort to shift and build the right processes and infrastructure to actually say, well, what do our audiences want to hear? What's the content that we need to generate in order to provide that, what our audience wants to hear? And then who are the right people to deliver it, create it, and then how do we get it down into human language versus what a research analyst would do? So we've spent about five years doing that and, uh, and, had, and had good success in actually transitioning from, I'll call it traditional brand advertising through TV, print, things like that, to using our intelligence and using content and then leveraging social and digital channels. And it was really because of necessity, but it's actually become core to our strategy right now, and it will continue. 
Pete, I'd love to hear from you on this. The Boston Globe is a content machine, and it's an enormous one that's like probably turning the Titanic going from print to digital. So talk to us about those challenges and how you're dealing with that. Sure. So um, we're a content company. And, and some would say we're the original content marketers. But uh, you know we've been producing content for 145 years. But uh, so for us, the challenge isn't about creating content, at least on the B2C side. I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what we produce each day. But it's really um, uh, transitioning that and tailoring that in a way that can foster the uh, conversation better with our with our target customers. So uh, our challenge is a little bit different. We, we you know we we produce hundreds of stories per day, and uh, it's really getting our producers and our news and editorial staff to start to think a little bit like marketers and how do they not just create and publish. Uh, in a way that they, they've done traditionally to drive eyeballs. It's how do we do it in a way to drive engagement. And uh, one of the areas where we're seeing success around that is around uh, empowering our content producers and trying to get them to be content marketers uh, with some you know, analytics tools. And, and we do uh, things on our, on our free website, uh, boston.com. Uh, where we uh, we do headline testing and we do uh, content optimization and all of it's to drive that engagement. So uh, we certainly haven't figured it all out. We, you know, we've got the fire hose of of uh, people touching our content and experiencing our content each day, and it's really about getting smarter and better with that group because uh, our real uh, near-term opportunity is just. Uh, yielding more off of our existing uh, our existing users. Terrific. Anybody else? Uh, Ilya? Yeah. So at our startup, uh, it's real simple. We use content to generate leads. Ninety percent of our leads come from people coming to the website, wanting to learn something, and they download a white paper or an ebook, some tutorial on something. Um, and that's really the core of what the whole marketing team does. There's four of us. Uh, five now, uh, and everybody produces content, and we really treat it like, like the our software development team treats uh, product development. We have uh, used the agile methodology. Every two weeks, we have sprints. We get together and we really think about you know there's a long backlog of of content ideas, and then we decide for this week what are we going to do in terms of new ebooks, infographics, uh, blog posts, etc. Some of it is behind lead forms, much of it is not, and every time we create content, we think about the 10 different ways it can be repurposed. So if it's an ebook or a report, it turns into 10 blog posts, a bunch of uh, infographics, uh, so uh, even tweets with some factoids. So there's, you know, just like uh, American Indians used every part of the buffalo, uh, we use every part of the content we create in a bunch of different ways. Sue, were you, were you waving for the mic? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so at our heart, we're an education and behavioral change company. And so for us, it's really about content creation as well as content distribution. And in terms of content creation, we've got multiple audiences. We're trying to create a market um, with schools uh, to really to sort of engage in a debt management conversation, which is tough because they want you to come to school and pay tuition. And we're asking them to talk to their students about something they'd rather not be associated with. So it's about thought leadership, establishing how talking about debt management can make them a thought leader, and creating content management assets that, again, we put some behind a lead management form, others not, but trying to seed that conversation and be helpful. With students, it's really a question of the right content at the right time and the right channel. And so finding the right content, some of it is um, expert content we create. Others is peer or near peer user generated content. And then the delivery mechanisms really vary. It's really about mobile and social as much as publishing at a destination website. So what I would just add is that um, we've been really trying to think about why we're creating the content and making sure that it's connecting to something that our clients want and trying to shift. I've been trying to shift the, my team's thinking away from what do we want to achieve with it and really what is the benefit there. And so. Uh, an insight that I found really um, very helpful was um, from the corporate executive board 
they did some research on B2B buyers and found that 57% of the decision-making process is complete before they actually engage with the company. And so what we're trying to do is think about how can content disrupt that process and earn, help us earn the right to get into the conversation earlier. And so, you know, that was across a lot of different industries, but I went back to our um, salespeople and relationship management folks and, and validated that, yes, they felt that way. And we've spent the last year doing uh, research with um, investors around the world and trying to understand what is the goal and why do they want content and how does it add to the decision-making process and in fact told my team to stop creating new content. I put a moratorium because I just felt like we were um, not really sure the higher order of what you know the content was being created for. So um, I think the why is really important and then organizationally having clarity around what roles different people play and so are you, I'd like to think of our marketers as the publishers, using the um, newspaper analogy, and then we have editors. So the editors are more the people that are writing the content that are close to the subject matter experts. But what we're trying to do is create the vision for how the content all comes together. So it's a journey, we're on it. Can't tell you that we've um, finished the journey, but that's, that's kind of our story. So just a couple of thoughts. Uh, Eaton Vance, we, we produce a ton of content uh, every quarter. We jam through hundreds of white papers and insight pieces and data packs. And uh, everything has to be put through compliance. And what we're doing now is saying we can't just keep scaling more content for content's sake. So two things. One is analytics. We are getting to the point now where we have, because of our content management system, we can track the usage of every white paper and piece of content. So we can say, you know, they're really 10% of the, the content gets used a lot. There's probably 30% that you know, one or two people use them. So how do you optimize what goes into the factory in the first place? Is, is you know, with limited resources, uh, how do you make sure you're getting the most value out of the content that you're producing? The second thing that we're really working on hard is content amplification. You know, a single white paper and a PDF on your website is, has very limited uh, Access. So how do you take that same content and cut it up in all the different varieties and shapes and sizes to get the maximum benefit? So we're also trying to do fewer pieces of content but more versions of that content in, available in different places to optimize the full mix. We're never going to be able to scale and double our teams of writers and editors and approvers. But the whole idea going forward is how can we use analytics and uh, distribution channels to get the best value out of fixed resources? So I think I'm hearing a constant theme here. And it's not just about more content and content for the sake of content, and it, although I think that's a, something that a lot of companies are still on that sort of treadmill. Um, it's really about making it matter. And, and how do we make it matter? How do we make that message more relevant to the consumer in a world that's increasingly fragmented and, and inundated with content? So we would ask, is Obama onto something? Obama put a spotlight on something that the Wild Agency has been practicing for quite some time, and that is behavioral science, figuring out how to nudge customers toward that desired behavior change. Um, Obama got onto it when uh, Cass Sustine published his book, Nudge, and uh, he created a nudge squad to help develop public policy. Everything from um, healthcare policy to energy policy to get um, citizens to do the things that are in the best interest of the country. Um, but that's exactly what we're trying to do as marketers, to nudge our consumers, our clients toward that next step. Um, so I would ask you, have, have, um, have any of you experimented with behavioral science? Do you have thoughts on how this can really change the dialogue and influence um, your end, uh, end goal here? Um, I'm going to start with Pete on this. Do you have a... Yeah. Sure. So, um, from, uh, so the way we think about behavioral science is really just getting in the mind of, of the customer and so what tactics and techniques we can employ to understand what's happening uh, with that person. And uh, uh, our experience uh, to date really has been focused on two main areas. Uh, one is 
uh, through email. We've been testing certain uh, approaches in, in uh, human behavioral targeting to see what works, and we've seen some early success there. But I, I think the area where we're also putting a lot of emphasis on um, really understanding the behavior drivers is around the online uh, subscription purchase. So when a customer, uh, you know, thinks to, to purchase a digital new subscription, you know, that, that's not uh, uh, what everyone uh, comes to the site and thinks of first. So how do we get, understand, get inside their head and understand the motivators? And so we, we think of it as a kind of like an inverted funnel. Uh, where at each point, in each stage, in each uh, interaction is a decision. And, and we, we try and um, understand what uh, drives the, what we call micro yeses. So each is not, the, the macro thing is we're trying to get someone to purchase a subscription, but it, the, the, it's a compilation of 20 individual decisions to get the customer to that point. So. We, we've started to really hone in on that, and uh, through experimentation, we're getting better at it, but it's really, it's humanizing the, uh, the mechanics of kind of the, uh, the purchase funnel. And, um, it, you know, we've seen a lot of success, and, and we continue to, to grow, and to that extent, we, that's an area where we're investing a lot of our resources, both time and money. So. We, we've, uh, you know, like, like many others, we've got limited resources and, and putting more eggs in, in that basket of optimization and really understanding um, the human decision engine is, is where we're focusing quite a bit. So um, for us, we just, out of curiosity in the audience, B2B or blended, B2C, B2B, how many people are in that kind of camp? Okay. So um, we, in, uh, when I talked about that research that we did um, talking to these very sophisticated investors around the world, one of the things, we did not embark on that as um, a segmentation exercise. It was more to understand the drivers of decision making and, and things that we could change in marketing to you know, have better results. But what came out of it, surprisingly, was a segmentation that helped us to think more like um, consumer marketers with these very sophisticated buyers. So uh, we had tended to approach them purely on their day job and you know the fact that they're highly analytical, um, very investment focused, rational decision makers. And what we're trying to teach our sales forces and trying to approach in our marketing is recognize the obvious statement that they are people too and that we should be looking at um, we're teaching our salespeople to profile for those sort of factors. So the type of person that talks about wanting to be at this special event and, you know, what is their behavioral profile and tagging them so that we make sure that we include them in very network-oriented events versus perhaps the person that wants every bit of intellectual capital that we have because they're very, um, you know, they need to validate with um, other sources. So for us, um, we're trying to learn from the consumer side and make sure that we don't be too snobby about the fact that, um, you know, there's multiple dimensions to these individuals. The, the, um, the place where, where we're probably having the most success right now in terms of behavioral sciences is in targeting and um, in what we call is, is uh, mess being able to deliver messages in a contextual manner. So um, we are constantly with our, with our partners, uh, media partners and otherwise, optimizing a message based on the patterns that any one of us would have when we're on a website or when we're on multiple websites. So, you know, there, the algorithm that's, that can get, get written as a result of the behavioral sciences allow us to say, you know, well, okay, Neil is on, um, you know, yahoo.com, and we've seen that he's gone to XYZ sites before that, so we're gonna take this bit of content, you know, because there is no shortage of content, like everybody said. In fact, content's commoditized, in my opinion, and the hard, the hard, challenge for us as marketers is how do we make sure we have meaningful content that then gets ascribed to us, right? So that's why where brand comes in and channel comes in and all that stuff in my opinion. But so the good news is, is that we can put this content out there in a more contextual manner. So it might be a slightly different message delivered to Neil versus it would be to somebody different because of the way he got to where he got to. 
Um, now again, th that still though could be content and you guys might ascribe it to, oh, that was T. Rowe who did that or Merrill. I mean, you know, so the, the issue to, to me is how do you make sure that the content gets ascribed to you? So I think we're, we're doing better there with making sure we have content in, con in the right context for the individual. The, the place where we in theory should be able to get to more quickly but we have systems limitations which you just want to tear your hair out on is, is in, your, in your own site. So, you know, we, we, Bank of America, we have 50 million customers, okay? That's a lot. You know, there's 300 million people in the United States. So, 50 million customers, we don't have a good way of being able to just track those behaviors across, you know, the varying accounts, the varying relationships they have with us, and their entry points. Do they come in through the bank? Do they come in through Merrill? Do they come in through U.S. Trust? So on and so forth. So, um, we have all these pilot tests that we do, which are um, you know, leveraging behavioral sciences, but our systems are you know, probably 10 years behind us being able to actually capture that data. So I think w what we've learned over time is that you know, the systems will never really probably catch up with the demand and what we need to do. So we gotta figure out how to build uh, that behavioral science infrastructure almost I'm call it independent of, because it's not independent, but sort of outside of our systems that support us internally because it, we, just, we will never catch up if we, if we rely on our own systems to do it. So. I just want to share a statistic and see how you react. Maybe this is where you're going. Um, researchers just confirmed that 95% of decision making happens in the subconscious. So think about that as we're thinking about content and targeting and building behavioral science infrastructure support. Um, you know, how does that sort of influence how you might change what you're doing? I wish I were answering that, but um, <laughs> uh, behavioral science is way too highfalutin for Eaton Vance marketing. We just try to not <laughs> piss people off. You know, that's you know, that's kind of the basic: uh, be relevant, don't waste people's time. But one area that we really are focusing on: we are a sold product through our sales force. So the whole behavior of how the in office across the desk sales experience happens, the behavior of our sales team, what happens before they walk in the building, what happens at the meeting, what happens as a follow-up, do they use an iPad, do they use literature, is there a follow-up with email, that's the area that we're really focusing on, that behavior. That's a smaller uh, set to focus on and it's, it's a lot of it is, is just qualitative and, and talking with the sales force on what works, but that's really how our product is sold. So we try to do the right things with good calls to action on our email and uh, you know, a good executive summary on a, on a white paper so that our, that our content is, is read and we try to target well. But I think the real behavior that we're trying to figure out is how does marketing really help sales sell? And that's a, that's a tough behavior uh, to influence. We have a different market. We're dealing with 18 to 24 year olds, so I think about 120% of their decision making happens subconsciously. <laughs> um, and, and we're about trying to teach them to change their impulses or overcome their impulses, which is really challenging to do because we don't necessarily get to follow them through their entire college and postgraduate journey. So for us, it's, it's interesting because different business models vary with, with the globe and with, uh, with Bank of America, but some similarities. So for us, it's about uh, micro-targeting, it's micro-habits, it's tiny interventions of tiny bits of content at the right time. If we hit somebody with a tweet, or as we call it, a snackable nugget of content at the right point in their journey, maybe they have a tuition bill and they're thinking about how to pay for that, maybe they're just at graduation and they're in that golden hour of thinking about